Hi, Cross and Crown. Welcome. Uh, glad that you guys are joining us today for this service. Uh, all our guests, wherever you may be, welcome. We're happy that uh, you have found us and have decided to join us for worship today. We're in the book of Romans, and I'm going to read chapter 12, verses 9 through 16. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for this time that we get to dig in. And I pray, Holy Spirit, would you empower me? Would you uh, make me able to articulate what you want us to hear from this passage? I pray, would you open my mouth so that I could speak and teach as I ought to, uh, in clarity and in a way that's helpful and in a way that would honor the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, open our ears and make our hearts soft and receptive, that we could hear and that we could respond in faith and in repentance to what you want to teach us today. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been an interesting few weeks, I think, for you as much as for me. And one thing that we've been getting a lot as kind of pastoral team is the question, uh, I want to do something, what should I do? It's interesting, I can really relate to that. I, I have certainly felt what should I do in the midst of this time, what can I do? Uh, how am I to behave being that I am a Christ follower? Right? How can I engage in what's going on in, in the broader culture, what's going on in our city, what's going on in our nation? How, how should I engage with that? How should I think and talk and behave right now? Right? And I think sometimes what happens is when, when we're troubled and when something is really on our hearts and it's weighing on us, there, there's something in us that wants to relieve that tension. Uh, that's certainly true for me. Uh, when I'm troubled and when I, I feel sorrowful or when, when I get really emotionally engaged with something, I have this desire, I have this, almost this need to do something, anything, to relieve the tension and to feel like I'm not just sitting on my hands. Now, now, mind you, every once in a while, I think it's good for us to actually do nothing. It's good for us to shut up, be quiet. It's good for us to listen to what God would want to speak to us in that moment. Uh, it, it would be good for us to cease activity so that in that moment of quiet and in that moment of inactivity, the Holy Spirit can speak to us because we're obviously more attentive to his still small voice. Yeah, and sometimes I think that's the right thing, but sometimes the reality is that we already know what action to take. Right? This particular passage, I actually really, really love because what we have in it, we have Paul's blueprint for Christ followers. His blueprint, how we ought to think, his blueprint of how we ought to behave and how we ought to act in how we love God and how we love others. Right? That's, we talked about it. Jesus, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so we have those two commandments, love God, love people. And here Paul essentially is saying, now, if you're a Christ follower, if 
You have been loved by God, saved by God, rescued from your sin, justified in the eyes of God, and brought into the family of God, then here is the blueprint on how you are to act, how you are to behave, how you are to speak in the midst of all this. And so uh, that's what I want us to, to take a look at today. All right, I, th I think uh, these verses, we've said from the very beginning, uh, chapters 12 all the way to kind of uh, the beginning, the, the first section in chapter 15, is Paul's um, kind of making it practical. He's been very theological throughout the first 11 chapters in Romans, and now chapters 12, 13, 14, and the beginning of 15, it becomes very practical on how are we to live out our Christian faith. Uh, how are we to live out as sons and daughters of God? How are we to engage in a world uh, that is broken, in a world that is sinful, in a world that, that is uh, anti-God in so many different ways? And so today, this segment, this section, uh, is really a section that describes how I am to love people, all right? So, so let's uh, dig in. Uh, I think the first thing that we've got to realize, it's for Christ followers. It's for Christians, all right? Uh, this listing right here, when we go through it, let love be genuine, uphold what is, uh, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, all those different things that come ultimately, is not something I can expect from someone that isn't saved. Now, maybe they display aspects of that, right? There, there certainly is kindness in non-Christian. There's generosity in non-Christian. There, there, there are all those things. But ultimately, this is what we, you and I as Christ followers, will be judged by, uh, whether we are displaying those kind of traits, all right? And so, uh, Essentially, because of the therefore in the first verse of chapter 12, right? Therefore, what Paul is saying is, if all these things are true, and if all these truths have been applied to you as a Christian, if it is true that God has loved you, God has rescued you, you have received salvation, you have received forgiveness, you have received new life, you have received an indwelling of the Spirit, you have received all these things uh, by God's love in Christ for you, then this is what you are to do, all right? So it's for Christ followers. And, and here's what I want you to remember, and, and I think it's really important. It's important for me right now. Uh, one of our production staff has this, this shirt that I really love the message on it. And the, the bold message, there's some fine print as well, but the bold message is you're deeply loved. That's an awesome, that's, that's a great thing for us to remember, right? That is who you are if you're a Christian. If all these things, chapter 1 through chapter 11, have been applied to you, and you have been brought into the family of God, you've been saved by the work of Jesus, you're deeply loved. And through that comes the empowerment of the Spirit to do all these other things. All right, so that's number one. It's for Christ followers. Number two is, and we talked about this, it's a logical response. It's a reasonable response. It's a rational response to what God has done, right? And we, we saw that in the first verse of chapter 12 as well. Uh, the ESV translates it here, it's your spiritual worship, but really we discovered the word is logicon. It's your logical, it's your rational response. So it's a logical response. Uh, number three, it's a worship response. What he says is present, offer up, your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the desire that Paul has for every Christian. So it's a logical response to the love of God in Christ, but it is also a worship response. And we said it's a whole life worship response to the love of God in Jesus. All right? And number four, then, it's a faith response. 
What do I mean by that? Let me, let me show it to you. Uh, we've looked at it, but it's something that is really, really significant, right? Uh, verse 3 says this, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith. So it's a faith response. Now, what... what it's an interesting verse, right? Because it talks about pride, it talks about humility, it talks about thinking of yourself in a sober way. What's he talking about? Well, I think, he, here's what's interesting. It's a faith response versus a pride response. See, when, when I'm able to look for all these benefits that I'm loved, that I'm accepted, that I'm justified, that I am adopted, not as a result of something that I have accomplished, something that I have done something that I have earned, something that is rightfully belonging to me because I'm so awesome. But if I fully engage in this, that this is about faith, it's not about what I have done, but it's about what Jesus has done for me, what Jesus has done on my behalf, then that crushes pride, right? It's no longer about, oh, I'm so deserving. Oh, I'm I'm so amazing, of course. Oh, I'm so much better than this other person. No, no, no. We're the same. Desperately needing the work of Jesus to be applied to our lives. Desperately needing the forgiveness of Jesus for our sins. Desperately needing the rescue of Jesus to be applied to us. Right? Desperately needing as orphans the adoption that is in Christ. So if, if I can understand by faith what my salvation is, that it is all accomplished in Jesus that crushes my self-reliance and it crushes my pride. All right? And so this is why it's a faith response. Now, now, let me talk really quick about pride, because I think it's something that's important. We, we sometimes don't fully comprehend what is pride, right? There's pride that's easy to spot, and then there's pride that's a little bit more insidious. It's a little bit more hidden. It's a little bit more tricky, right? Uh, and so there, there's, here's just kind of like generally how we would look at pride. It is being overly concerned with self, Right? C.S. Lewis famously said that uh, it is, humility is not about uh, thinking less of yourself, but simply thinking of yourself less or, or less often. Right? Uh, so pride ultimately looks to my value, my accomplishments, and feeling good about that. But there's a little bit more to it. So the, here's three things. Three things in regards to our pride. Uh, there's those of us who are simply preoccupied, right? We, we can't help but think about us, how I feel, how I think, what's wrong with me, right? And oftentimes, it's very self-effacing. And, and so the individual might look to the casual observer as, oh, okay, they're, they're humble, right? They're, they're thinking poorly about themselves, maybe, Right? Maybe they're full of self-loathing. Maybe they're, they're full of self-pity. Maybe they're full of, oh, I am so evil. Oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I'm so terrible. But here's the thing. They're preoccupied solely with themselves. It's all about me. They're continuously thinking about themselves. And, and that's a form of pride. All right? Now, there's number two, and this is kind of, maybe we would see it a little bit more, it's self-infatuation. They're just in love with themselves. They're so, they're just, oh, they can't get over themselves. And again, you have the kind of the common denominator is they keep thinking about themselves, right? It's this crazy thing. So they're preoccupied with themselves and they love it. They're so excited, like they can't, oh, I am, I am so amazing, I am so wonderful, and they consider themselves better, smarter, prettier, more accomplished, right, more worthy of consideration, more worthy of attention than everyone else, and, and they just are enthralled with themselves, right, and that's, we, we kind of can see, okay, yeah, that's how we typically think 
of pride. And then there's a third one, and that's self-exaltation. And that's a person who continuously wants people to praise them, to honor them, to exalt them, uh, to, to be full of acclaim for them. And so that's, that pride ultimately will hinder every other aspect, every other thing that Paul is calling us to in this section. It's interesting. If you look at the section in chapter 12, 1, uh, chapter 12, yeah, 1 was saying, therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Then in 3, it addresses pride, and it says, think of yourself with sober judgment according to the measure of faith. Look to Jesus. Don't look to yourself. Be Jesus-occupied, not self-occupied. Be Jesus-focused, not self-focused. Be infatuated. Be in love with Jesus. Don't be in love with yourself. Right? That, that's essentially what that verse says. And then as you go all the way through, you see that there's all these things that the author is talking about, about how do we practically, tangibly love our neighbor, right? Remember Jesus? Love God, love neighbor. Paul here is saying, here's all the practical, very tangible list of how to love your neighbor. Well, it ends in verse 16 before he then goes into, and, and this is how you deal with those who persecute you. This is how you deal with those who are outsiders, who come after you, right? It ends in verse 16 with, do not be haughty. That means proud. Don't be proud. Associate with the lowly. Right? What does that mean? Well, it's the people that can't offer you anything. Loving them will not bring you a reward physically, right? He said, don't be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Don't just have relationships that ultimately will profit you, will help you gain something. And then never be wise in your own eyes. The word here can also be translated, don't be conceited. And, and what is that? It's this idea of snobbery. It's this idea of I am right, my way is best. Right? It's this idea of I'm very status conscious. I'm very much concerned about me and my position and how people view me. And so pride from verse 3 to verse 16, frames the passage. Now, what's in between? We started it last week, and, and the key from last week was, will you love one another? Right? Verse 9 says, let love be genuine. Let it be without hypocrisy. And then, love one another with brotherly affection. Verse 10. And outdo one another in showing honor. What, what he is saying there is love is what he's after. That's his primary goal. Uh, one of the commentators I read this week, and I thought it was really interesting, because our Bible sort of add, you know, headings, right? Like if you have a normal Bible, it probably has the chapters, it has the verses, and then it has different headings. And that's Obviously, later editions. I mean, the chapters and verses, later editions. Some monk on the back of a donkey going, you know, from one town to another. Hey, here should be a, a chapter break, right? Uh, these headings sometimes can be helpful, sometimes actually can confuse things, right? In this one, several people who've studied this believe that it's potential that, that let love be genuine actually is the heading for the next section, because in the Greek, there's no verb. It doesn't say let. It just says love authentic, love genuine. And then it gives us the list. And so in, in a lot of ways, I think what we have here is, okay, that's the next step. The, the response to God's love in Christ is logical. It's a whole life worship response. It is a faith response and it is a love response. And practically, the way this love works itself out is then kind of listed in essentially these bullet points or in these categories. Now, I read something this week that I thought, man, I think that's probably true for every church. 
Mark Dever made this comment, and he said this, Our church's most devastating failures and most glorious successes will be connected to how well we love. Wow. I think that's true. I think it's not just true for his church. I think that's true for cross and crown. We will experience glorious success if we love well, if we love authentically, if we love tangibly. I think we will experience devastating and heartbreaking failure if we fail to love in the way that God commands us to love. All right, so love that is genuine. Now, now some of you will look at the list and you'll find some things to be easier and some things to be harder. And I think if you look at the list, I think it can even be something that it could easily be condemning to you. Man, I don't want that. I don't want that for you. Right? Romans 8 says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Conviction, yes. Correction, yes. Rebuke and exhortation, absolutely. But no condemnation. And so maybe we could look at the list and we could say, okay, there's things certainly that each one of us could work on. Let's take it as as an encouragement, as an exhortation, maybe even as a rebuke from the Lord to love more genuinely. But then there's likely some things that you're really good at, that, that you're already practicing, that you're actually, wow, this is amazing. This is really encouraging. And what I would want for you as you read this and as you hear me articulate it, I would want you to be encouraged. You are following Paul's blueprint of what it means to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, of what it means to love well and love tangibly. All right, so I want you to hear, yes, there may be some things where you need to hear an exhortation to allow the Spirit to work in you more fully. But I also want you to hear there may be some things where the Holy Spirit wants to breathe life and wants to breathe encouragement into you. All right? Now, the list is, it's not long. It's just these bullet points. But there certainly are some things that seem to be difficult, right? I mean, like I read some of these and I'm like, oh, that seems tough. Yeah. Yeah. That's love, right? I mean, here's the bottom line. No one would ever say, oh, man, I ran a marathon and that was hard. That kind of goes without saying. It's like, yeah, duh, yeah, 26.2 miles. That's hard, right? That's the same with love. No one ever says, oh, to love is hard. Yeah. Genuine love starts where it's no longer effortless, where it's no longer simple, where it's no longer easy, right? Right? The the greatest display of love from my wife, Andrea, to me is when I am difficult to love, right? When it's not effortless. When it's effortless, it's still love, right? But she won't feel like, oh, I kind of got to work on this. No, it's when I'm making it difficult on her, when I'm challenging to love, right? That's when love really flourishes. That's when a Christ-like, not a love that we are, able to conjure up, but a love that has to be empowered by the Spirit, has to be empowered by the love of Jesus, has to be empowered by the work of God in us, that constant work of sanctification. That's where all of a sudden it's being displayed. So let me, let me walk us through. There's, there's essentially um, about nine categories uh, and, and I've taken those categories from John Stott. I've really enjoyed how he kind of broke it out. Uh, but let me walk us through this. The first one uh, we've already talked about last week, and that is this idea of sincerity. An honest, unfaked, unhypocritical love for others, right? And, and that is then followed by discernment. 
All right, what, what does that, do I mean by discernment? It's what we talked about last week. Abhor what is evil and hold fast, cling to, be stuck to what is good. Now, now here's what's interesting, and this is the only thing I'm going to say about it this week for fuller treatment Listen to last week. But what this means is there's something that's objectively good and something that is objectively evil. All right? See, in our minds, in our world, in our society, we kind of flip it. We say the things we love, they're good. The things we hate, they're evil. Paul switches that around. He says there's something that is objectively good because God declared it to be good. Cling to that. There's something that even if the whole world decides this is good, God has declared it objectively evil and therefore abhor it, be horrified by it. I mean, the Bible says that people will call what is evil good and what is good evil. And that's what we experience all around us. So we need to have discernment as Christians to be able to work through this. Then we have the issue of affection, right? Love one another with brotherly affection. We have the issue of honor. We talked about that last week, right? Outdo, compete with one another in honoring each other. And now, in verse 11, we kind of get into the, the next segment that we haven't covered yet, and the first thing we get is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, passion, right? Here's what Paul tells us. He says, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Right? What he is saying here, he's saying there is a passion required for the Christ follower in pursuing the glory of God and the good of people. He said, be, do not lack zeal, do not lack fire, do not lack passion. Be passionate. Just, well, we learned in chapter 10, verse 2, that there's a whole bunch of people that have zeal, the Jews, but zeal without knowledge. So Paul would say, well, you need to have zeal with knowledge. You need to be passionate for the right things. You need to be passionate in the right way. Here's what he's calling us to. He is saying, be passionate for the glory of God and for the good of all people. And fervently, passionately, intently, not, don't be lazy about providing opportunity for the Spirit of God to set you ablaze. That's really what the, the word is saying, what the, this little verse is saying. How are you fervent in making space for the Spirit? Are you, are you praying? Are you taking time? to just step away from the busyness of the day? Are you, are you reading the Word? Are you allowing the Word of God and the truth of God and the fundamental faith to permeate your being by being in the Word and reading the Word and meditating on the Word, thinking through it? What does that mean? What does that say? How does it apply? How can I grow in that? What commandment is God giving me here? How should this renew my mind? How should this change how I view the world, right? To what extent are my presuppositions not based on the truth of the Word of God, but are based on the supposed truth of the culture around me? To what extent is my worldview is the lenses by which I see the world and judge everything, to what extent is that fully formed by the word and the truth of God, and to what extent are these lenses that have been forced upon me, right? This idea of don't be conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So be fervent and passionate about giving space to the Holy Spirit. When we did a series on uh, the spiritual disciplines, so uh, fasting, prayer, silence, solitude, Bible reading, Bible study, all those kind of things. What we said is these spiritual disciplines are vehicles for the Holy Spirit to work life transformation, right? Here Paul is saying, 
be fervent in giving space, in, in carving out that space for the Holy Spirit to work in you. All right, now he's moving on. And, and really, this has to do with patience and with endurance. Verse 12, rejoice in hope. There's times when it's difficult to get any level of joy, right? But what he is saying is, yeah, there's joy in circumstances. There's a legitimate joy that you get to experience when good things are going on. But at all times, be joyful in the hope you have. What's the hope we have? Well, we, the hope we have is that Jesus is coming back to bring us home. That Jesus is coming back to set all the wrongs right. The, the hope we have is that justice ultimately will be served, right? Justice for every sin, justice for every affront, justice for every evil, justice in every category will be done. And it's going to be rendered either already by Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary or it will be rendered for all eternity in hell. We have hope that justice will be served. We have hope that love will prevail. We have hope that we have a, a home that we're headed to. That's the hope that Paul is speaking of. He says, have joy in the hope of Christ. And only, only that joy can ultimately lead to a patient endurance, to a like hanging in there when tribulation comes, to a perseverance in suffering. Well, this is what he says. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Are you suffering? Are you hurting? Are you struggling? Remember your hope. Remember your hope is in Christ. Remember, your hope is in Jesus. Remember, your hope is in his work once for all done for you. Finished. Finished. It is finished, is what Jesus said on the cross. Your hope is in Jesus coming back. It is in Jesus bringing restoration. It's in Jesus setting all things right, making them the way they were supposed to be. As you're suffering as you're encountering tribulation, as you're encountering persecution, as people hate you, as people misunderstand you, as people speak ill and evil about you, be patient. And first and foremost, be constant in prayer in those times. See, what, what Paul is saying is, a hope is in the work of Jesus alone. And when it is just threatening to crush you. Where you go at that moment is you go to the Father in prayer. And that's where you find your hope. That's where your refuge is. That's where your, your place of safety, your place of comfort, your place of being enveloped in the loving arms of God. That's where that is. So he says, your hope is in Christ alone. You're able to patiently endure all suffering and all tribulation in the midst of that. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. Talk to your Father. Speak to Him. Listen to Him. Get into His presence. Right? So that's patience. Then he says, love also works itself out in this way, in generosity. And he gives two examples of generosity. All right. The first one is contribute to the needs of the saints. The second is seek to show hospitality. Well, in, in those days, hospitality was something absolutely needed. Right? Uh, it actually means stranger love. Right? There's one where there's a brotherly affection, but this right here means to pursue strangers and show them hospitality, inviting them into your home to feed them, to provide for them a place to sleep. In those days, when Christians would travel place to place, to, it would be dangerous 
to sleep in the market square. There weren't many like inns or hotels that didn't exist. And the ones that existed often were brothels, they were unsafe, they were seedy, they were troubling, right? And so for Christians to go to a new city, it was absolutely necessary that other brothers and sisters would practice hospitality. It also was used in just that particular culture to bring in people and to share with them, to make them from strangers to friends and then share the good news of the gospel with. What Paul is saying, contribute. There's people in need. There's people suffering, struggling. Cross and crown, thank you for being generous so that we as a church can be generous and we can contribute to the needs of the saints, right? When this whole thing started, we knew, man, this is going to be a tough time. People are going to lose their jobs. People will be without uh, the resources to feed their families. How can we serve them? And so we started a generosity fund. And, and several of Cross and Crown's members are administrating that fund, right? Uh, together with Emerson, our director of operations, uh, and Pastor Simon, that team is making sure that the, the needs of the saints are being met. Thank you. Thanks for being generous. Thanks for giving to the needs of the saints. It's awesome. Hospitality, opening your homes up to people that you don't know, to people who are strangers. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, when I was a missionary in different countries, I would share a meal or I would sleep on someone's floor in their living room that was a believer but had never met me. I had never met them, right? When I was in Kazakhstan, when I was in, in Kyrgyzstan, when I was in India, sleeping like with Christian families <laughs> that were strangers until the very moment we met, right? And they practiced hospitality with glad hearts. Paul right here says, that is one of the ways in which we can show authentic love. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. What he is saying here is this is the issue of grace. Grace is to receive something that you don't deserve well or to extend something and give something that they don't deserve. What Paul is saying, true love, genuine love, a tangible evidence and outworking of that love is when people are persecuting you, when people are cursing you, you will pray for them. You will seek to be a blessing to them. You will extend what they don't deserve in that moment. All right, That's kind of elaborated on verses 17 through 21, so that's going to be next week. But just for the moment, remember, you've been the recipient of grace. Would you be the conduit of grace as well? And then verse 15, we get to this amazing sentence uh, that has to do with empathy, sympathy for those that you're engaging with. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now, if you're proud, if you're self-preoccupied, if you're self-indulgent, if you're self-infatuated, that's going to be very difficult because you simply don't care what's going on in someone's life. But what Paul is saying is, as a Christ follower who has been deeply loved by Jesus, we never, never stand aloof of the sorrows or the joys of people around us. We engage in that. See, we in love want their best. That's our longing. And if that's true, when they are suffering, when they are weeping, when they are full of sorrow, we cannot but engage with that. Now, that may be a little bit easier for some of us to weep with those who are suffering, struggle with those who struggle, right? Be concerned for them. It may be much harder for us to rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? Because our pride... Our envy and our jealousy are rising up. And we don't want to celebrate their successes. And the Bible is saying, a mark of genuine humility, of 
humble love, of authentic love, of non-hypocritical love that flows from the love of God in Christ to us will always engage. It will engage with the suffering and the sorrows and the weeping, and it will engage also with the joy and the celebration and the triumph of others. And we will rejoice with them. So th that aspect of sympathy. Then we have the topic of unity. All right? He says, live in harmony with one another. All right? How, again, it's an issue of humility. When we don't agree, can we disagree harmoniously? When we have differing opinions, when we have differing ideas, can we live harmoniously? I think one thing, and I've said this before, that, that I so struggle with right now, is that not only is it no longer possible to, in a civil and in a kind way, in a reasonable way to disagree with one another, it's impossible to agree in a nuanced fashion. No, what's demanded is a wholesale, full approval and championing of the other's ideas, or you've become the enemy. Friends, that, that can never be the case with Christians. With Christ follower and Christ follower, let love be genuine. Let love overflow. Let love be ultimately what is driving us, what's motivating us, what's making us unified. In Philippians, passage we studied, right? Same topic, two ladies at odds, Eodia and Syntyche. And Paul says, I urge them to be unified. I urge them to put their, their differences aside. I urge them to be of the same mind, to be living in harmony with one another by having the mind of Christ, who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And he humbled himself. And he took that road from the glories of heaven to the cross. Right? Again, same exact thing. It is the example of Christ that is motivating us toward genuine love. And then he wraps it up again with the topic of humility. Love, authentic love, Christ-like love, has no room for pride, but it pursues another in humility and in kindness and in concern. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So here are the, the, the issues, the bullet points. Here's the blueprint of Christian love given to us by the Apostle Paul. It is sincere. It practices discernment. It, it is affectionate. It honors others. It's enthusiastic and passionate. It is full of patience while finding a hope in the work of Christ. It is generous just like Jesus is generous. It shows grace because we have received grace. It is full of empathy and sympathy for another. It pursues unity and it does all that in a spirit of humility. So friends, are you like me longing to do something, anything? Well, if you're still asking the question, what should you do? Could I submit to you, your calling has not changed. If you're a Christian, your calling is to reflect the glory of God to a watching world, right? To demonstrate and to declare the gospel of Jesus. That's what you're called to. As an image bearer of God, that is what your job is. Your mission is, hasn't changed, right? What, what's your mission? Your mission is to be a disciple and to make other disciples. Your assignment has not changed. It is to love, Je love people in Jesus' name, right? Your identity has not changed. Like, I know it's chaos all around us. It's pandemonium. But who you are 
has not changed. You're a daughter. You're a son. You're an heir of the living God. That's who you are. You are deeply loved and accepted. That's your identity. And friends, your hope hasn't changed, right? Your hope is in Jesus. It's in the work of Jesus on your behalf for your salvation. And it is in the place that Jesus says he is preparing for you. A place that's going to be glorious. And that's ready and waiting for us for all eternity. Let love be genuine. I love this text. I love the book of Romans. And my hope is that in this time that's crazy, in this time that's challenging, in these days that are difficult and heart-wrenching and heartbreaking and, and sorrow-inducing and confusing, you and I could hold on to this truth. We have our marching orders. We have the blueprint for our lives. And so let me pray that we would cling to that uh, during these times. Lord Jesus, thank you for this, this book. Thank you for this passage. Thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have invited us in. You have extended grace to us so that we could be conduits of that grace. And you have called us to love God and to love people passionately, tangibly, visibly. And I pray, God, would we be women and men that would do that fervently, passionately, joyfully. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Cross and Crown and our guests, this is the time for us to celebrate communion. Communion is uh, a weekly, in our case, a weekly reminder of what Jesus has done. It's a weekly celebration of what he has accomplished on our behalf. It's a weekly highlight that says, you have been loved, and now you get to love others in Jesus' name. So if you have prepared the elements, uh, the bread represents the broken body of Jesus, broken in our place. The cup represents the shed blood of Jesus, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And I want to invite you uh, in just a moment to take these elements and to remember and to declare the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to do that until he comes back to rule and to reign.